Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, coming to you from Waikiki Beach, just above St. Augustine's uh, Catholic Church. By the way, we like to tell people, if you're ever coming to Hawaii, why not go to our website, deepadventure.com, and fill out a contact form and say, dude, what's the, what's the best luau to go to? Or how about having a cup of coffee with us or something like that? So we're right here in Waikiki. So the best thing in the world is when we don't know who the tide's going to wash up, but we love it when people show up on the shores and we get to get to know you. So go to our website, deepadventure.com. Just let us know you're coming. And by all means, come to Hawaii. Hawaii is open. Uh, and uh, would love to op- the, the the name for our bay here means to have open arms. So in, in Oahu is the gathering place. That's what it means. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. I was just just had a friend of mine uh, show up here in Waikiki, someone from high school. I haven't really seen her except for once in all those many years. And uh, we were just having a great conversation, uh, uh, having some Hawaiian coffee down on the beach. And I told him, oh, I got to go. I got to go interview this. My, my next guest, he's going to talk about the best reasons, the best arguments for the existence of God. And I go, I don't know. I probably don't even need to, you know, interview him because I already know the, 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 the obvious two best reasons for the existence of God are number one, Hawaiian coffee, and number two, chocolate. So if you, it, you know, so it's easy to understand uh, that God exists. If you're looking at it in, in my heavy philosophical point of view, we have with us today, well, Pat Flynn. Aloha, Pat. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. It's, it's great to be here, Bear, and I appreciate your deep philosophical contribution because so far we've already had bacon has been proposed oh bacon right, for the existence of god um, <laughs> but hawaiian coffee is a new one to me i wasn't familiar with this with this approach well, so thank well, you bacon yeah. bacon you know uh, by the way pat flynn the, his new book the best argument for god uh you uh is coming is coming out actually right now this week as we have as we're airing this broadcast but you know what i'm ukrainian dude and so do you know the, why the ukrainians are catholic i don't well the, our emperor vladimir back in the day uh, I forget what century it was. Uh, he he wanted to get rid of paganism, so actually he sent out envo- envoys to the Muslims, to the Jews, and to the Eastern Catholics at Sophia Hagia Sophia there, and they came back and they said, well, you know, the Muslim religion sounds like a good religion to adopt, but they don't eat they don't eat bacon. I mean, literally, that was one of their concerns. And, and that, that was it, yeah. And then <laughs> and then and then the same thing with the Jewish faith, right? Now I'm a Ukrainian dude. <laughs> And so we love good food. And so they went to the Hagia Sophia and they came back and they talked about the beauty of the sacraments, the beauty of the, the they, they talked about beauty and bacon, yeah. beauty and bacon. Glory and, to uh, God. And right. so, so that's, that's the essence of the, my Ukrainian culture. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You know, sometimes the simplest <laughs> ways are the best, right? Yeah, yeah, the Lord has his way, you know. Well, we're going to have a great conversation today, but first of all, I want to talk a little bit about your own personal journey. If you're watching this on YouTube, you get to see that he looks like one of the early church fathers uh, with his long Greek beard. Uh, and uh, I think we have matching microphones and headsets, so we're like, we look like twins, don't you think? Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> but we want to hear a little bit about your own personal journey, and then I want—I really, okay. I love this discussion on the on the philosophical reasons for the existence of God. So, tell us a little about yeah. a little bit about you first. Yeah, so I'm I'm sort of the cliched story that you hear a fair amount these days. Um, oftentimes, it's not philosophy; it's science. You'll hear, "Hey, you know, a little bit of science pulled me away from God, then a lot of science brought me back to God." Uh, so similar story to me with philosophy, but I'll I'll go a little bit deeper. So I was baptized, but I never really received any, you know, full or proper catechesis, very nominal, you know, upbringing in terms of religious commitment, like kind of priesters, but not even not even that. Right. Uh, so it wasn't um, it wasn't really difficult for me to to move away from whatever whatever sort of minimal faith commitments I had as soon as they started to become challenged in my life. And I remember, um, you know, the first point of real challenge that I can uh, recall with a lot of clarity, uh, this will date me for better or worse, would have been in the in the sixth grade. And uh, actually, sixth, sixth kind of, grade, that was the best three years of my life, dude. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But me too, man. <laughs> but uh, so you know, it's kind of interesting because I didn't realize it at the time, but I sort of encountered what Thomas Aquinas considers the two best arguments against God, or at least are the the only two arguments that he considers uh, in his Summa against the existence of God. And one of them is the problem of evil. Hey, if God exists and God's perfect, then why are there so many horrible, awful things that happen in this world? Perfectly fair question, right? Whether it's a good objection is something that we can certainly It's probably talk the best question. Yeah, it's the question you yeah. have to wrestle with. Yeah, but there's a, a second one that he considers, and that was actually the inspiration for my book. And that second objection is, hey, the principles of nature are enough. We actually don't need God to explain anything. It doesn't really add anything to our sort of big picture or our, our philosophical worldview right uh, so we can we should just be naturalists right it's a simpler theory it explains just as much so that's not like a disproof of god but that's something that many contemporary atheists will push that line of argument so again aquinas was really ahead of the game because those those two objections there, there are other objections to god but those are the those are the two that have really stood the the test of time well, and still get a lot of attention today yeah let's talk for a moment about that aquinas had this great way of of presenting the uh, the what he would eventually refute as the wrong as the wrong conclusion or the wrong argument, uh, but he did such a great job of presenting it in the very best way. He didn't make yeah. a straw man out of it. He, he still manned it. Uh, yeah, he, oh, very well said. Yeah, he he mm -hmm. presented that argument with real clarity. Well, so often now you hear arguments, they're all confused, they're all conflated, or they're or they're or they're they're uh, straw man arguments. But he, yes. he he gave it the dignity that it deserved to say this is but what that argument is. And then he would go and he would say, yeah. on the contrary. Yeah, and that's that's something, you know, so I'll, I'll get back to my story, but um, that's something that really impressed me about St. Thomas when I finally encountered his work was that he wasn't interested in just knocking down cartoons. He was somebody who really took objections, strong objections seriously, and I think gave serious responses. But I'll rewind the tape a bit. So anyways, I sort of encountered those two objections in the sixth grade without thinking about them explicitly because that was when 9-11 happened. We watched it on TV in school. So big problem of evil thing, right, as a young kid. And it was also in the sixth grade where we sort of got in a, you know, a middle school sort of way, you know, the the outlines of Big Bang cosmology, you know, the, the history and story of our universe. And immediately I kind of realized, hey, that isn't, you know, sort of what I was told in that first grade Sunday school class that I had, right? What I remembered mm -hmm. of it, like, where's Adam and Eve? Where's the snake and all this? So, you know, that kind of classic conflict between science and religion or the idea that, hey, science has got this. We can explain everything just from within the principles of nature by itself. We don't really need God. So like those those two objections were sort of right there. Again, I wasn't explicit about them. I had I was in sixth grade. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, but I could see that there was there were conflicts and tensions, at least. And of course, you don't just throw your hands up and declare yourself an atheist on the spot. This was just really the sort of seed of doubt mm -hmm. that kind of grew over time, if you will. So when I finally got into philosophy sort of proper in, in high school through various people I liked reading, um, actually Mark Twain and Angel Mencken were two writers that I, I really enjoyed their writing. And they were always both playing with kind of really interesting philosophical ideas. Mark Twain has an essay on it's called what is man it's on sort of a free will determinism classic mm. issues that really that really got me thinking and and wanting to it, realizing that whatever this is is the sort of stuff i want to spend my time thinking about right and that that that's, happens to be philosophy it, it wasn't chocolate uh, and it wasn't chocolate then no i mean i love chocolate i just had some right it's, before the podcast actually <laughs> a little chocolate with almond butter so but you're in sixth grade and, and you start you having these heavy thoughts that's so cool yeah, well, this is a little bit later in sixth grade. Mm. This is probably uh, like uh, high school. Yeah, for sure at this point. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, none of it's super refined. But I, I get passed off to sort of the old atheist existentialists, H. L. Mencken. He and he was an old, he was an old, old school writer, and he was an old, uh, very staunch atheist too. So he was always kind of talking about, you know, different theological themes. And he was, you know, uh, actually considerably more sophisticated than so many of the new atheists we have today. Right. Still, uh, still, yeah. still crude. Still crude looking back now, but he didn't right. seem crude to me at the time. Right. Right. Uh, so he kind of got me interested in Nietzsche, and that was kind of my my way in, if you will. And to... Nietzsche, Nietzsche, everything he his words are like every word's like dynamite when he writes. Uh, he's yeah, so he, he's not always clear, but he's often profound. Yeah, right? it, yeah, <laughs> that's a great way to say it. he he. Uh, but he grasps, he grabs you. With his, he does. He's such a wordsmith. Of course, he's yeah, being but, translated. But I mean, he, 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 and so it's so easy to to be persuaded. 
yes. or to be drawn Especially in as by a that. young as a young male. You know, he's very right. bold, he's very assertive, he's very right. poetic, he's very aggressive, and it's you know, for, for young men that's that's kind of a, an attractive quality in many respects. Now I look back at him and I'm like, Okay, dude, what's what's your actual argument? But compare him to compare him to compare him to Dawkins and the, the the four horsemen of the of the New Enlightenment or whatever they call them. Uh, yeah, quite a right, contrast. So. And, uh, we're, we're talking with uh, Pat Flynn, his new book, The Best Argument for the Existence of God. And we're talking about his own journey towards intimacy with God. And uh, along the way, of course, he, he had these philosophical arguments that, that confronted him he had to deal with. Pat, how can people find you? Yeah, you can find me uh, through my podcast, Philosophy for the People. It's on YouTube. It's on, on iTunes. That's Sounds the like spot. a great show. Sounds like it's a great show. In the book, where can they find The Best Argument for God? Uh, through Sophia Press, so you can go right to the publisher's website, but it's also on Amazon and all the usual places as well. Yeah, and we love Sophia. Don't you love the people there? Oh, amazing. Just They're amazing, the best. Yeah. They're the best, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah they, I, we'll be right back with my guest, Pat Flynn, right after this message. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue. Through Bears Man Cave Community in our three-year school of manliness, Join at DeepAdventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion? Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at DeepAdventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to Notre Dame fcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul. Both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com, and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, we have our guest today, Pat Flynn, his book, The Best Argument for, for God, which is uh, published by Sophia, which is also my publisher. And uh, they've just published, published my third book. It's called 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? And it's just a really cool book. My wife and I were driving along the beach here in Waikiki, going around Diamond Head, and this song comes on the radio, and she says, you're going to love this song, and she turns it up, and it's, uh, uh, it's by a woman, uh, I think her name is Cole, and she, uh, she's singing this song, Where is my John Wayne? Uh, wh where's my happy ending? Where, where have all the cowboys gone? And it just grabbed me, and so it became the inspiration for this new book. I, I'm a big Louis L'Amour Western fan. If you watch it on our video on YouTube, you see I have, I have 105 of these genuine imitation leather-bound Louis L'Amour books. His men were always virtuous, and the women were always strong, which was not the, uh, the typical way women pre presented by novelists back in those days. And so I reached out to his widow, and they gave me permi she gave me permission to use some of his quotes. And so we kind of go the cowboy route in this book, and it's really a book for women. M women will like it, especially I'd like to see young women read this because it outlines really what a, what a man is. But it's a great book for uh, men to use in their, in their, their small groups uh, or men to read to their sons or, or brothers to read. Uh, so uh, it's like a father speaking to a son or like brothers speaking to, e to each other. So it's pretty gritty. 
kind of mixed grit, grit and grace mixed together. It's something that men can really get traction with and help them understand. I kind of motivate them, encourage them, challenge them. So uh, go wherever you want to go to go, go get this book, but get the book. Women, send these out as gifts. You mama bear, send these out as gifts. 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? So we're talking today with our guest, Pat Flynn. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, his new book, The Best Argument for God. It has the grit, you know, when you, when you start reading Nietzsche, and 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 I, I, those earlier authors, I, like Anthony, uh, flew back in the day. Part of the, he was a member, I think, sure. of the Inklings. Those arguments. To, when I read Dawkins, I just think this is. I, I just feel like it's a bunch of straw horses they're setting up in their arguments. Yeah. But those guys, that, if you can grapple with them and still come to the to to the the the, the understanding that God is God is, then you've come a long way. So you were so you were in high school and you're dealing with these philosophical issues. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I agree that with respect to the new atheists, they don't they don't make them like they used to. Right. The old atheists were much more, I think, interesting, much more consistent uh, with following through to the logical endpoints of an absurd, you know, starting point. Right. Um, to the sort of absurdism and nihilism they, they wound up at. And it's something, you know, that now that that being said, there's there's still, you know, more obscure contemporary atheists that that are have more interesting things to say than the Dawkins and the Hitchens and those guys, so I don't want to discount that. But one of the things with uh, you know engaging with the with the old atheists is that they were sort of willing to bite a considerable number of bullets that they saw as either entailments as inevitable outcomes of an atheistic paradigm or at least probable outcomes. Things like a nihilistic perspective on the world absurdism you know Nietzsche is one of them you know everyone's kind of familiar with his his God is dead which is which is properly understood as a lament right it's a warning oh, it's a that, lament um, that, but also that, you, can do can you quote that I mean that that two sentences or three sentences where he says that is just mind-blowing yeah well can you paraphrase the, the context, it? yeah well the context for people who don't really understand sort of Nietzsche's wider project is yeah Nietzsche himself was an atheist he was a naturalist but I think he was somebody who saw that God did provide a theoretical anchor or principled way of explaining many features of reality that we take on common sense. One of those things would be the moral dimension, right? That there really are moral facts, right? It may make sense to say that some things are right, some things are wrong, that we should do some things, we should not do other things. And I think Nietzsche pretty clearly saw that that was in, in some way linked to the existence of God, that if you kind of unhook from that, you no longer have any any grounding for affirming this sort of objective moral dimension. So he does say, you know, there are no objective moral facts. And the context of the God is dead is this kind of guy who's, you know, seems loony, but he's actually saying, like, you guys just don't get it. Like, you don't understand the consequences right. of the perspective that you're living in. But they're coming. Like, they'll, yeah, it's they'll, like the, they'll become apparent, right? It's, God it's a is, warning. God is dead and we have killed him. Right, and, yes. And, mm -hmm. and the whole universe is is, is fall, basically falling in on itself. And as you said, it's kind of loony. And he did become he did he did uh, he saw someone someone I think whipping a horse and he had a some sort of uh, I don't know consequence of that ended up basically in an asylum insane yeah and, and, and his so, last you know, words some, his last words were what oh I forget but something some, like, some oh, people, he, well, mm -hmm. it was oh mother I am a fool what have I done yeah is that it yeah I know something there's like a lot that, of yeah. Yeah, and he may have had some syphilis or something there's a lot around his his death it's very peculiar but so to tragic be, yeah. so tragic because he really right. wanted to wrestle with truth but he went he went so uh so far the other way so here you are in high school and you're reading these 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 older real powerful writers uh, that were yeah. were denying the existence of god so yeah. how, what happened yeah, so there's kind of two ways you can, I think, go bare once you're kind of colored by an, an atheistic or godless paradigm. You can either, uh, I think, if, if there's two ways you can go if you want to be consistent, I should say, if you think consistency is important. And if you're starting from this atheistic <laughs> yeah. principle of indifference, right, that whatever else is at the bottom of reality, it's it's not an entity that's malevolent or, or, or benevolent, certainly, right? It's not aiming at anything. It's not a perfect being, right? It's just, you know, it's just mindless bits of physical stuff, whatever, right? Um, and then when you try and draw out the the implications of that, I think you start encountering um, uh, just absurdity after absurdity, right? And and so what you can do if you're trying to be consistent is you can just sort of try to as best you can accept those absurdities, like somebody like Nietzsche might do. And it wasn't just the moral dimension. He said without God, 
we don't have grammar, right? He doesn't even think thinking makes sense in a right, God's exactly. world. Right, exactly. And, I, and I agree with him. I agree right. with him, right? It's really hard to make sense of how you get rationality from a non-rational base, right. how you get intentionality from a non-intentional base, how you get a qualitative experiential dimension from a non-qualitative, non-experiential base, right? So, like, there's all these, like, qualitative leaps that are supposed to happen that seem to me categorically impossible. How do you even you have a moral... Around. How do we even have a... A moral inclination. I mean, where does that come? Why can't we yeah, just I, kill each other? I, you know, it's just, I think I think if you're an atheist, what you have to be to be most consistent without being too ad hoc, right? Is you have to say that these are just feelings we have or drives we have that were somehow useful for survival that have no bearing on anything beyond the fact that they're just mere feelings. And if some people don't want to go along with those feelings, then that's all that we can say. You, about, you have right? you have the social contract of do no harm, but. It's a lot more than that. Even a little kid knows injustice. So you took my candy. <laughs> you know, there, right. there's a moral. There, I and mean, when you take someone's kid, takes someone's candy, he knows it's wrong too. I mean, there's that moral element, that yeah. conscience, that in, 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 intuitive part of us. So right. now, so now you're continuing on your journey. Uh, and, and and what's happening to me, Bear, is I'm hitting these absurdities right consistently. Mm, mm. I don't know how to make sense of these basic features of the world that, to me, are frankly undeniable. That I am a rational, conscious agent. Atheists deny that that's even a thing. Many of them do. That there is a moral dimension to the world. That I do have some significant sense of moral autonomy, free will, if you will, right? And these are these were big ones for me. So as I kept going deeper into the paradigm, and I didn't say superficial with it, I started to realize the principles of nature, at least understood by a naturalist, are not enough. They can't they they, they can't explain anything really. And what they force you to do is to explain away certain things right that what you think is real in fact is some sort of grand once, once you jump to jump right. from physics to quantum physics it's like all, all bets are off you know it's like oh, I, you know as far as what re, what is actually real and yeah, why, why and, do people spend so much time these guys their whole life is about god it's just about denying god i mean it's just so bizarre you know that that they're evangelists for they're not being a god but okay so now yeah you know i and this is this is a that's an important point because what i've realized in many years after the fact is you know not all former naturalists or atheists were, were like me at all you know i i never had an issue with religion you know i never had a bad experience with religious people i never thought religion was the reason for all the ills of the world like i just like i didn't really have a dog in the fight so to speak yeah right it's just something on and the I, I, yeah Go ahead, and sorry. I think that's a, I think that's important because I think it, it it allowed me to be uh as close to an ideal agnostic on the issue as possible. Now nobody is ideally agnostic on anything. We all have our, you know, inclinations and biases or stuff like that. But what I've realized and I, I don't think this is unfair to say is that many people are just and some of them are explicit about it. They're atheists because they just want to be. There right? there's an angst there. There's an there's angst, a, there's an anger, there's a there's a political or an emotional bias of yeah. some sort. Well, you know, there's something else that's really in the driver's seat. Let me, let reason is is there to justify in an ad hoc right. way the positions they've already committed to for for some for some other reason. And I, right? I would say this: we're going to take a break here, but I would say I, yes. There's there's a there's another reason, and a part of it I think is because of moral decisions. You know, oh, yeah, I think you know, that's a huge like, like there's a, sure. Paul said people have been given over to a reprobate mind. When you when you kind of raised, uh, and by the way, there's no natural atheist or agnostic. Every remote tribe that you find in the world, you know, isolated tribe, they have a religion. There's an upward yearning in all men. But yes. when you when you can when you decide, well, I want to have sex outside of marriage. I want to do pornography. I want to, uh, you know, become greedy or whatever these things are. You kind of have to change who God is. So that your conscience doesn't bother you, and you just relegate God further and further away until it's you're twisted and you have mo no moral compass. Uh, yes, I kind of got off on a track. We're talking with Pat Flynn, his new book, "Argument for God: The Best Argument for God," and we'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Dan Laboon Markham with another episode of Country Up at the Bishop Markham Ranch in Goldendale, Washington. Warrior. Watch the movie Talladega Nights where that wily NASCAR driver, Ricky Bobby, a.k.a. Will Ferrell, did a fine job of making it plain he preferred the cuddly Christmas baby Jesus over the grown man Jesus. Most folks like a Jesus made to their own liking, rather than the one the good book and the church teaches. 
You see, Jesus went to war by speaking the truth forthrightly, and that upset a lot of folks, especially religious folks. Still troubles us today when we read straight from the good book, as it should, or when we hear that rare preacher who gives it to us straight with no sugarcoating. Jesus came to earth as part of the airborne infantry, parachuted behind enemy lines. From that very day, his enemies were trying to hunt him down to kill him. Well, he finally outfoxed them all by allowing himself to be arrested and crucified. Army generals, they call that a feint. You see, it was Friday, but he was looking towards V-Day, Resurrection Sunday, because there the tables of the universe would turn a 180 on Ricky Bobby's track. The Bible says at that point he defeated death and the devil and led us captives out of darkness into freedom. No longer behind enemy lines, Jesus and his empowered followers began to assault the gates of hell, driving darkness out of folks' lives, gradually building the kingdom of God, which Jesus told us is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. His followers are still doing it. No longer victims, but warriors. So my fellow warrior, let's saddle up and head down range. This is Dan LeBoon Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps. Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite the men there to go to deepadventure.com and join uh, the Man Cave. Uh, the Man Cave is our non-Facebook community. Uh, of men that are we're kind of like the cave of Adullam, like King David kind of hid out there and all these knuckle draggers, these misfits kind of showed up and joined him while David was on the run from King Saul. And the Bible says they were they were people that owed money or were running from the law or I like to say maybe running from their mother-in-laws and uh, they just hung out there together but they formed each other and God formed them into the mighty men of valor. So that's what the man cave is and you can go to deepadventure.com and join the man cave. And then we have a two and a half year school of manliness that, go, that, that is part of the man cave uh, where you, we go month by month as a group through one of those rules and uh, we have a monthly Zoom meetup. And our, our job is really to kind of get people launched, uh, men launched and starting maybe their own men's group. And, uh, and, uh, but it's a great place for men to bring their teenage sons through, their confirmation age sons through the school of manliness. They can't be part of the man cave. That's only for adults. And, and for single moms out there, uh, get your sons involved in the school of manliness. Uh, go through the curriculum with them. They help them uh, identify what it is God is calling them to be. We have as our guest today, Pat Flynn. Uh, he looks like, if you ha can't see him, he looks like a young version of Anastasius, probably one of the early fathers. He's got the, the long beard. And uh, to go along with his philosophical bent and his new book, The Best Argument for God. So, uh, so then, so you're, you now you're, you're facing the absurdities of agnostic or atheism, and you're in high school. What, what happened next? Well, like I said before, if you're trying to be consistent as an atheist, not trying to be too ad hoc, there's two ways you can go. You can either try as best as you can to embrace those absurdities, and I don't think that's livable. I don't think you can ultimately be successful with that. Or you can revise your starting point. 
right? Um, you can go back and say, okay, you know, I must have made a mistake somewhere along the way. And the only, I think, place you can locate that is right at the beginning, right at the foundation. So, you know, I, at, at some point, Bear, I literally threw my hands up and I, I said, I don't know what is true, right? But I'm pretty darn sure that this isn't it, right? <laughs> and that's, that's where I was at that point. This, this would have been, this is out of high school now. This is, this is, this is a number of years later. Were you I'm taking convinced. philosophy classes at the time Would you, when you called? Yeah, yeah. So my master's in philosophy, my undergrad, while I took philosophy uh, courses, was not in philosophy. It was in economics and, and finance. The philosophy program was just a horribly hijacked program at the uh, undergrad institution I went. So I wasn't mm -hmm. about to waste my time on with that. Um, I, I, can, and, I can I interject something? I, yeah. In my own personal journey towards God, when I was 19, I took philosophy at Baylor University. Great course. Yeah. There's only 12 of us in the room. And I'd gone through a whole thing about is God real and who is God. And it was that philosophy class that really turned me towards God because I, we didn't spend time, we didn't look at Aquinas and people like that. And we looked at the modern modernist philosophers and all going all the way back. And I finally thought, every one of the people I thought missed the mark. They were close yeah. but missed. And I became came just kind of disillusioned because uh, I tried so many other, looked at so many different things, and it was it was kind of at that moment that the Lord just grabbed me. You know, was yeah. like if, I was like, if that all there is, then why not s sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Because I'd lived a pretty moral life, and it was right. at that point where it kind of came to the end of man's thinking. I think they haven't figured it out. Buddhism isn't the answer, and so yep. yeah. Th so to take this philosophical journey is really, really uh, a, a beautiful path, an important path for people that are on it right now. Yeah, so, I think so. I think so, and I'm trying to you know mark the path as best as i understand it uh i also think that it can be like even plato kind of indicated like hey be careful messing around with this stuff because it might not wind up for the best <laughs> for a lot of people for philosophy so i always like to I always like to say that right and, and scripture warns about the philosophy of men it doesn't warn against philosophy of christ or right. certain but the certain philosophies are are sort of hijacked and that was the impression i got when i was first considering you know philosophy in the undergrad i, I just got a whole bunch of political indoctrination those classes right, i'm not going to right. spend all this money getting a degree in in just being angry at at this all the time no way <laughs> right um so then so, you, so yeah you're going on in life you've got your you've got yeah. your degrees in so your, i'm still i'm still deep in philosophy sitting on my own at that point and like i said i went and you know did my master's in it at a much better institution for the stuff i was looking for um but right so so i'm i'm now i feel like i need to start fresh or as, or as fresh as i can so what I want to do is I just want to start going back to thinkers that I did have a passing familiarity with in indeed some of those undergrad philosophy courses like Plato and Aristotle, but you know, never really spent all you know more than uh, you know what you would spend with them in an undergrad course type of thing and, and trying to understand okay these guys seem to think differently about the world, maybe they'll be able to answer or provide a, a basis for some of these questions that have been troubling me so much right. So long story short. Uh, you know, Bera, I, I start to realize that there is this sort of perennial philosophy, right, that sort of encompasses Plato and Aristotle. Yes, I know they're different on, on many things and can talk about how they think about the problem of universals. But in, in general, they're actually far closer together in terms of their philosophic worldview than, say, a Plato and a Nietzsche, right, or a modern day materialist, right? So I'm realizing, okay, it's, it seems like people in this neighborhood like, kind of agree generally on a lot of principles and aristotle didn't throw out plato and socrates he didn't start fresh no like some of these other modernist philosophers they just yeah, throw everything and, out and, and and the reason he critiqued plato as much as he did he says it is because plato was closest to the truth he had the yeah. greatest admiration mm. for plato is like all these other crazy guys will refute them quickly but we're going to spend time on plato because like this this guy's on to something right yeah and and I, yeah i totally totally agreed with that and then once i discovered uh not just saint thomas aquinas but the whole Thomistic tradition, all the you followers found Aquinas. of Saint Thomas, you found Aquinas. Right? Yeah. How did that happen? You know, that's a that's a that's a great question. I don't even think it was Aquinas first that I found. I think it was some other philosopher who was a Thomist. Mm. Uh, this is so long ago. I I, I, I really can't remember. Um, but it was, and then that eventually pointed pointed me back to Saint Thomas Aquinas. Um, and it was, and I and I do want to emphasize, it was the whole Thomistic tradition and so many modern day. Thomas, people who tried to complete Thomas's project, uh, thinkers like uh, Bernard Lonergan and, and Norris Clark and um, Father Brian Davis and Herbert McCabe. There's there's so many brilliant you, thinkers out there. You look at you look at they're in the tradition of Thomas, mm -hmm. but the Thomas looked back at Aristotle. He well, didn't. That's what that, yeah. You know, there was this there was this that 
Go ahead. I'm sorry, but there was a yeah, stinking... yeah. No, that, that, that was that was exactly what I was going to say. You're you're spot on. Is that I? You know, some people like to say, well, Thomas was you know he's the first great medieval philosopher. I don't think that's right. I think he was the last great classical philosopher. Well said. I think he. Well I said. think he perfected, refined that perennial philosophy that encompasses Plato and Aristotle and 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 all. And those it's the type guys, of philosophy right? you don't throw out because it fits for all ages. When you take his synergism, where he 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 sifted it. You know, he yes. distilled it, uh, in, as Augustine loved, and, loved Plato. And synthesized it, yes. Right, mm -hmm. but but so so Aquinas, of course, I love that, his book, The Summa for Beginners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. It's a real, yeah. But so you found, book, you right, yeah, found yeah. A, the, 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 a Thomas and you found Aquinas. Yes. And what I start to see in this Thomistic picture, this called just perennial philosophy, which is sort of anti-reductionist, anti mechanistic, anti-nihilistic, -nihil anti-skeptical, anti-relativistic. It's sort of anti-everything that modern philosophy is all about. What I find is, is, is a system, it's a whole theoretical system, that is, in a sense, common sense. Like Aristotle's mm -hmm. often known as the, yes. you know, the king of common sense. Yeah. But what it, it's common sense insofar as it allows you to hold on to most of your common sense deep intuitions about reality but provides a very deep metaphysical structure for saying this is why you can hold on to these things right isn't it beautiful? this is why you can still continue to believe that things that seem perfectly obvious are real features of the world like free will and rationality and the moral dimension right he gives you that whole and there's lots to the system itself isn't like easy to grasp right but it's it's very intricate very well worked out but at the end of the day it is a system that makes sense of the whole and make sense of common experience and hangs together. That's the other thing that attracted it me. It hangs about. together. It, and it stays it's together. It stays it together. Hangs, yes, it does, and, it, it, and it's it, very resilient. And That's we right. need Thomas yeah. now more than ever with all the craziness with the transgenderism and all this oh, all this other that. non yeah. all this other mm -hmm. nonsense. So 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 then you're finding Aquinas and then when, what was the moment when you go when when, when did you cross that bridge? Yeah, so I, I well, was we got a minute very we got a minute here. We got a minute here. So give us the the start up to that. Yeah, we'll yeah. Long story short is once you you know start dabbling with with Thomas, you, you're always getting a heavy mix of theology in with it, right? Well, he, right and in I his writings, he, I wasn't uh, particularly interested in that at the time because, like most uh, ignorant Americans, I thought that you know even though I was, I was open to religion, I thought well maybe it's got to be something in the East that's true, right? So I was very interested in. Uh, Buddhism. Yeah, you'll go to you get you go further east, but oh no, we don't right. want to stop off in Palestine. Yeah, or I don't even want to like look at the the parish that's right down the street. It's just this weird yeah, you, thing. That's right? what yeah. I did. I went to Buddhism. I did the exact yeah, yeah. same thing. Well, okay, so we got to take a break here because I don't want to make this short thrift of what you're about to share with us. We're talking mm -hmm. with Pat Flynn, his new uh, book, best the best argument for God. It's a tremendous book, and uh, we'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Where can they find you, Pat? You can find me at uh, Philosophy for the People on YouTube and iTunes. And that's the name of your podcast? That's correct, yep. Philosophy for the People. Uh, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm Bear Wozniak. We'll, we'll, we'll be right back with more. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak adventure. 
plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Baron Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. still listening i thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station while well, you asked for it here is more of the bear wasnick adventure aloha welcome to the bear wasnick adventure we have a have, have a, as our guest pat flynn he's a thomas i just love i just thank god for saint thomas you know the was it the whole baltimore catechism uh kind of redistilled and 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 the revival of Thomistic teaching wasn't it I, you know I don't know it's, but I wouldn't be surprised that's, that's what you know case. If, if, someone, if, if some, we read it to our, we read it to our kids a fair you do yeah because yeah, yeah. they have the children's version I mean they, they, it's actually official version it's, it's just great at, at dinner just you bring out the little Baltimore catechism it's a and it's Thomistic to because it asks yep. questions very much very much mm -hmm. like Aquinas but you know for someone who's so for someone who's listening there a, a thinker because I always say Catholicism is a thinking person's religion mm -hmm. um, so we're inviting you to listen in now with Pat Flynn as he talks about his journey and that and now his conversion through reason or, or we'll find out at least that that yeah. was a big part of your journey is 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 reason you're not you're not gonna just just say well I'm gonna put God on the shelf because I don't really I, I'm gonna go play hockey or something instead yeah. but you you wrestled with you wrestled with him like Jacob in the wilderness right yeah reason was a part it was a big part not the only part right we're, we're complex we have other things you know effective things personal things uh having children of course was a, and, and, was, the, and the upward yearning right? for god that he puts in your heart yeah they just that that yeah the, right our heart is restless until it rests in thee oh lord i totally think that that's 100 percent correct right um so right so as i'm as i'm thinking about god i'm really interested in natural theology and natural theology is what can we know about god through reason so i'm kind of deep in that and of course this is kind of what led me to certain thomists because when you're looking for different okay what what can we know about god through philosophy it, if you spend enough time in that you're going to hit tom you know thomism at some point probably sooner and later because you know thomists are out there putting forth a lot of these different arguments but as i'm doing sort of that i was reading a lot of eastern stuff i remember i was big into like aldous huxley and his perennial philosophy which is like a statement of religious pluralism right um but again, like I, I didn't. Uh, I found that it didn't satisfy the intellect in that direction. And as I was kind of getting deeper into Thomism and getting the mix of the theology, the thing that struck me, especially about not just Christian but Catholic theology, again, is its coherence. And coherence, to me, is a mark of the truth. By coherence, it's how well does everything hang together, and how well do some aspects inform and reinforce other aspects. Now, on the at initial Absolutely. glance, you might just you might just think that well, Catholicism has just all these teachings and so many different things it just seems like a whole mess but it's not once you once you dig into it you realize it's it's a deeply logical and deeply interconnected system amen where teachings about christ and christology deeply inform teachings about mariology for example right and it's mm -hmm. like that was very impressive to me because to me that doesn't seem like just inventions of men randomly putting things together just for the sake of oppression or whatever it seems like no these are people who are really trying to work out the implications and the truth of things and when you see something that's, that's, that's it fits that's, together that's, read right, that read this yeah yeah fitting you, this those, was a big thing for me for sure those people right. who are struggling with these types of thoughts right now i invite you to go to the catechism and start on page one and read through that because the, the new catechism has the beautiful uh writings of the early church fathers it has scripture and it has a uh, phil philosophy all, yes. all, all, all structured together, and it just—it's like I accept the teaching of the church because I have faith. Yes, but that faith seeking understanding, and in the midst of that, well, that makes total sense. You know, if that means yeah. this, then this must mean that, and and there's such a reward for for reading the catechism that it's like better than steak and lobster. I mean, it, oh, it's, I agree. it's, yeah. it's just yeah. like your, your ferocious appetite. Well, really? Well, what, what's the next page say? And so, I, but you got to I've literally had that experience. I remember one time I'm like, okay, I'm just going to read this Catholic stuff. Right. And I just picked the catechism. It was like a total page turner to me. Right? It's just like, yeah. It was like, it's like one of those like born novels, way better than the born novels. Yeah, you think? Like I couldn't put it down. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know? true. Well, the thing is, yeah. And the, and the, the, uh, but, but in a sense, also the catechism reads you. It's a great, 
great book to do Lectio Divina with, to read yes. and let it read you. And so to read, but to read a page or two at a time is totally legit. But, yes. but uh, so you can read it two different ways. You can read through it. Okay, I got the big picture. Now I'm going to go through and read line by line. And So, yeah, so now we're getting closer. We're getting closer. We're getting there. So I, at this point, I'm very open to, you know, at, at this point, I'm convinced that God exists from a philosophical perspective. And a, and a very, you know, I think sort of refined understanding of the classical theistic God as well. I think this is where good philosophy ultimately converges. And that, you know, that that automatically sort of winnows the range of options, right? If, like mm -hmm. if some religion is going to be true, like it's got to kind of attach to this well, so, idea of God. Right? But it has to be the idea meaning that there's one God. There has to be an one ultimate God, cause. eternal, immutable, omniscient, omnipotent, purely actual, perfectly good. You have a whole philosophical But not necessarily workout. Jesus. You're not you're not there yet, but you're to the point not, where you, you're right at the door knocking now. That's right, right, and and Catholicism, as a matter of dogma, affirms classical theism and divine. And all of that philosophically that is solid. Right? All the things that you right. just listed off are solid philosophy, and now you're right there. Okay, now yeah, and and I'm seeing happens. the church is getting a lot of a lot of good hits, right? It's like, oh, it seems like the church keeps keeps scoring on these philosophical points. That's sort of interesting, and not just metaphysical ones, but I really felt ethical ones. It's gnarly, too, right? It's gnarly if you go to Genesis. And it mm -hmm. makes sense. And you go to even the teaching on the the Trinity. It, it, oh, I see. I see how that makes sense. Well, that, yeah. how could how could these ancient Hebrews get it when you read an mm -hmm. obscure verse and it's just oh yeah, yeah they they got it right philosophically as well as okay I'm in, you better go now. You got four and a half minutes to not yeah look, get the home run. Well, look, <laughs> I'll I'll wrap this up the the story up quick. Is is at that point you know and I. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I said to my wife because she was never baptized and she had her own conversion that was different from mine, but parallel to mine in time. And I said to her, I said, Christine, look, I think there might really be something to this Christianity thing. And she kind of grew up in the South where they have a heavy anti-Catholic bias. So even though she wasn't Christian, the first thing she says to me is, OK, I'll think about Christianity with you, but no way in hell am I ever becoming Catholic. <laughs> she said, right? But at this point, like that was really the only option for me. Um, but by God, but, but by God's grace and, you know, uh, a lot of conversation and you know the biggest thing bear she said that uh at least opened her up to considering catholicism was she said she noticed the change in me the kind there of husband go. that there i was becoming wow. the kind of father that i was i was i was becoming seriously and only so, by the lord's so, grace so, so, i should so add right well, yeah. at what point mm -hmm. did you become catholic or you were catholic in thinking but still so, not ca yeah yeah so i was you know so when did i when did i come come fully into in, into to, the church probably, let's, probably let's, like let's say first fully to jesus and then into the church like yeah well yeah for, boy and uh, see if i give a minute i was a christmas eve and my wife was preparing a very very nice dinner and you know i was pretty much intellect was there at this point intellect was there and i just felt this deep pull bear that i had to go to a catholic mass that night now look you can see these glasses they're pretty thick i don't see good it was very dark it was snowing like crazy and I told Christine, I'm like, I think I have to go to a mass. She's like, what are you, crazy? You can't drive in, <laughs> drive in this weather, right? And she didn't want to go at this point because this is what she was still resisting. I'm like, I just got to go. I just That's go. I'm just so going to cool. go, right? That's so cool. So I go. I go to the mass. And the closest thing, and I really believe this was a, a truly spiritual experience. And I'm not a big feelings guy. I don't claim to have this often, almost ever. But when when it came to the to the consecration of the host, the Eucharistic prayer, that was the moment that I knew I was exactly where I needed to be, right? That that this was this was where it was all coming to, right? Wow. Um, so that that was it for me. You know, that was that was the moral, the spiritual conversion. You know, the intellect had been there for some time, but that that to me was was it. Um, and then and then yeah, wife, uh, she you know uh, about a year later uh, got baptized and confirmed. We got the kids baptized, and they all they're all in now and. The rest, as they say, is is, is history, right? And it, yeah. and, and it all hangs together. It's it's such yep. a beautiful way to to say that. But what I loved your intellectual honesty, you know, that through it all, you 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 wanted. Well, wasn't it the Inklings? Their their motto was to follow truth wherever it leads. And I think it was Anthony Plew. I think I'm saying his name right. He came in as a as a Methodist, I think, or his fa his dad was a pastor. The Anthony Flew that I'm familiar Flew, with is yes. the atheist Anthony Flew. Right. Um, and he was a, a fairly formidable atheist for many years, but he died uh, at least a philosophical theist. I, I don't think, think he ever I, ma made it to Christianity. I, I, I think, but, I think yeah. he did. I think he did right towards the end. 
That's right. And yeah, because, he, he definitely did. And I know he, people accused him of being insane. He's like, no, I'm yeah. still possessed of my faculties, friends. Yeah, Doc, <laughs> Dawkins is saying, oh, he went over the deep end. But he he was a member yeah. of the Inkling. He was part, at least on the on the periphery of the, of the Inkling, C.S. Lewis and and all and Tolkien, all those cats. Uh, but okay, he came, yeah, that's, he, that's he, actually interesting. Yeah, he was raised that, that he was raised yeah. he was raised mm-hmm. by a pastor. Uh, mm-hmm. His journey towards truth in the process of being there with the Inklings was to was to become an atheist. Yes, yeah, so, right. And, and isn't that funny? Because yeah, and then, at the end he wrote that he wrote that book. There is a God, right? Yeah, yeah and it was and, based. Uh, yeah, so it was based, I think, on the primarily on intelligent design, the the double helix of the DNA molecule finally convinced him. But but dude, um, you you you, I love your intellectual honesty and and there's. It, it, do you think there's beauty in truth? Of course. Yeah, yeah, I think beauty is a strong indicator of of truth, right? It's, yeah, it, and yeah. and and there's something, you know, this is this is another aspect of it. There's something just extremely beautiful about not just the church and her teachings, but the life of Christ in particular. Amen. Amen. And I I think that that is yeah, I think beauty is absolutely a mark of truth, yeah. And mm-hmm. and, and and there's beauty in truth. Mm-hmm. Truth itself is is one of the things about beauty is it tends to be symmet- uh, symmetrical uh uh, different shades, uh, different, but it, it, you know, here in Hawaii we see beauty all the time. But I got, right. I like to go down to the beach with my iPad at night and a cigar, a little hidden shot of whiskey, and sit That's there with odd. Augustine or sit there with Aquinas and just and just so I find so much beauty in the sunset and beauty in in the truth. We've run out of time. You know, I would love to have you back on the show. Uh, I would love it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll, I'll write to you about that. I think our guests would are listeners to our guest is pat flynn pat where can they find you yes again you can find me at philosophy for the people and thank you very much bear it's a podcast on youtube and and itunes Mm -hmm. you know what we'll do is we'll get you back and we'll talk more about your book (laughs) Yeah, we, really, yeah, we just, yeah, yeah, we just yeah. talked about your life, and we'll do that. So yeah, the book actually gives arguments. It's not just a, a story, but I always enjoy these these kind of free flowing conversations. It's always so much fun. Well, yeah. you, uh-huh. you know what? Our my, they just called the Bear Wozniak for a re- adventure. My show because we're all on an adventure, and it was really cool to right follow, follow yours. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you, aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.